this. Uh, don't know that I'll make it public, but I think I'll I'll share it here with the class. And uh, people may recall, I'm going to go and share my screen here, that in the exercise, I had asked you to, based on a description of a model and a spec model implementation that I had shared with you for any logic. I had asked you to transliterate this model into ordinary differential equations. That was the first part. The second part of the assignment asked, or the exercise asked you to solve for the equilibrium. I'd like to of this uh, system, the, the points where the system is in balance. And I'd like to go over both those components. Uh, so this system, is an infectious disease uh, transmission model. It's a bit different than most we've been dealing with because it includes only two states, the susceptible state and an infected state. When people recover from infectivity, where do they go? That's yeah, they go back to susceptible. Now that may surprise you. Um, and indeed there are many infections where one retains a persistent community. But there are classes of infections where immunity is short-lived. Certain bacterial infections, for example. Um, and somewhere it's almost non-existent because of the, the nature of the infection. For example, if um, you're infected by waterborne illness, or by foodborne illness, you're generally not going to retain a an immunity that will protect you for a persistent time. You could next week, if you go back to the same food vendor and it, who still has that problem, you may get sick again, unfortunately. Um, so there are class of infections where immunity is so short-lived we can reasonably approximate it as having an individual pop back from infection to susceptible. But at the same time, this model was characterized by the classic random mixing, or what's called mass action kinetics for spreading infection that involved contacts per day probability of transmission per discordant contact is kind of a susceptible and infective. Some fraction of the entire population that's, that's infected that is considered to be representative for a given susceptible of what fraction of their contacts are infected. And all that leads to this force of infection, this can anyone remind us what is the force of infection? Come on. What what is it in, in brief terms? What are its units or or dimension? Sorry? Uh so good good try, but the people per day would be the flow of new infections. The flow of new infections here is susceptible times the force of infection. What does that suggest the force of infection? Where have you also seen like the flow out of a stock depend on the value of the stock, because the stock is called S, S times something? Where have we seen that? Uh, well, that's true. We, yeah, we saw that there. And this is the same basic representation. I, I noted that. Um, it's the same basic model. But I'm asking you, where else have we seen this outside of strictly the, uh, the spread of infection? Yeah, yeah. This is, in general, what is this type of, what is this type of, uh, of representation called? It's called a, Begins with F, first, first order delay, right? Yeah. Um, 
to first order delay. So here we have a what in a first order delay, if we if the formula for this outflow is alpha times s, what is the unit of this have to be? One over time, one over time. It's a probability per unit time. A probability is like a fraction, a fraction of coin flips that turn up heads. So this is a probability per unit time. So when you multiply it by, say, say susceptible is measured in persons, and you multiply this probability per unit time times, times S, it's of dimension one over time times person, and this the this flow, as was noted, will be person per unit time, number of people per unit time at least. And remember that. All flows into a stock that's measured in persons, all flow out of that stock measured in persons have to be persons per unit time. If this stock were dollars, all flows into it would have to be dollars per unit time. All flows out would have to be dollars per unit time. If this stock were of vials of vaccine, the flows into it would have to be, you know, vials per unit time, like vials per day. If it flows out, it would have to be vials per day. Okay. So in general, when you see a stock, its flows have got to be the unit of the stock or the dimension of the stock per unit time. Okay, so force of attraction, coming back to this, if this fits in that same lot, that same picture, what is force of attraction? What are its units? It's one over time. Yeah, because the formula for this is maybe you don't remember it, but um, let's let's go call it up. The units of this are the the formula for this is force of infection times susceptible. So it's exactly exactly this form. It's just operating with something a probability per unit time. That's what force of infection is. Chance per day is equal to And when we estimated it daily using wastewater data and uh, data from the health system for Saskatoon, for, for the, the province as a whole, and for every province in Canada and circulated it to decision makers on a daily basis, we're estimating probably per day that somebody circulating in that area would get it back. Okay? Very actionable thing. How dangerous it is it to go and circulate in my population? Right. And it was one of those things that decision makers throughout Canada wanted to know every day for First Nations as well. We talked to them as well. So, so, so that's uh, the force of infection. And you recall how the force of infection is defined here. The force of infection is itself based on some number of contacts per day. A fractional prevalence, which is taken for simplicity to be to be the, the fraction of the whole population that's infective. We we take that for simplicity to be the fraction of the susceptibles contacts that are infected. So they have say a hundred contacts per day with with people in general. Of those, maybe 50% are with infectives, right? That leads to like 50 contacts per day with infectives. And we multiply that by the probability of transmission for each of those discordant contacts. So contacts between the susceptible and infective. We say that it, it transmits infection with this probability. So the overall probability per day that they'll get infected is approximated as this. Contacts per, per person per day, say 100 times fractional prevalence, say 50%. So at 50 people and 50 infectives per day that they mix with, and maybe each of them confers a percent, you know, 0.01 chance of infection. So they have a 50% per day chance of getting infected. Does that make sense? Okay. So that was the force of infection, right? And in this model, you could just read this off. I provided you with the model. Remember the fractional prevalence is just effective divided by population. 
And then this new recoveries is just infected by the meantime infected. Okay, so having shown you that, what are the ordinary, what is the system of ordinary differential equations behind this? How many differential equations are there? It's a system. I mean, I'm referring to the fact that in general, it's more than one. How many are there? Two. One for what? One for successful, one for cut. Each of those gives the rate of change of that stock, of that state variable, the rate of change of S. How many, is it increasing by five people per day or decreasing by five people per day? Given that the units of time in the smaller days have to be up. Value of plus five or minus five. If it were staying the same, if it were unchanging, what would the the rate of change be is susceptible? Zero. Yeah, it's constant, right? Okay. Good. So we're going to have one equation for this one it says what the rate of change is, the susceptible, and we're going to have one for infectious. Good. So we're going to have a rate of change of susceptibles and a rate of change of infectious. Now, to, to determine the rate of change of susceptibles, what are what if, if we if we are going to compute the the rate of change? So uh, the SDT or or F dot, we'll write it in in a brief fashion. What goes on the right hand side here? Anyone? What goes on the right hand side? It's a it's a sum of a bunch of things. Sum of a bunch of things minus a bunch of things. What are the things that have plus signs associated with them? Tony. Uh, the okay, for susceptible. For susceptible, well, in general, if we have a stock, what's going to be on the right hand side? The sum of uh, Harriet? Yeah, the sum of the inflows minus the outflows, right? Or you could say minus the sum of the outflows as a, as a part. In other words, minus each of the outflows. Good. So Tony's right. We, we, we have two flows incident on it. What are the inflows to susceptible? New recoveries and new infections. So now to express it as differential equations, we we have to express them in, in algebraic terms. So so the inflow to susceptible is these new recovery. So I'm gonna write down, and I asked you when writing these down to use S for susceptible, to use I for infected, to use C for the contacts per person per day to use beta for the probability of transmission per discordant contact, and to use tau for mean time effective. So what is the inflow to susceptible going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, Harriet, yeah. In fact is, so I'll call it I. Yeah, over tau, we, we do not as tau, this, this mean time effective, which I see. I request you call tau just so we could write it down briefly, right? That's the inflow. So I'll put a plus here just to you know make it really clear. What is the outflow? Yeah, the new infection. And so what do I have to write down here? First of all, is there plus or minus on minus? Good. So what's the formula for it? If I map it all the way down to the ODE semantic domain, down to, to, to ordinary differential equations. What, what's the first thing it is? C, good. C times I over N, and what is that again? Yeah, it's the, uh, N is what? Total size of the population. I, I asked you to use that term, okay. The total size of the population. What up there is, is, is up here called total population. You can barely see it. And then times what? Beta. And then times S, right? Right? Mm. 
Okay. Um, so, uh, and so that's minus. Why is it minus? Outflow, right? So if we have the same number of people recovering, if I over tau is the same as same number of people recovering per day as we have people getting affected per day, how will this be changing? It won't, it'll stay the same, right? If nobody is recovering, like let's say we're at the very beginning of an outbreak and five people per day are getting affected, how will this one be changing? It'll be going down by five people per day. Maybe there were a thousand people infected, a thousand people successful originally, it will go down to 995 because five people got infected and nobody's recovering, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So again, C for a given susceptible. That's why this whole thing we had called before force of infection or lambda, force of infection. This whole thing is times S. It reflects a chance per day someone who is susceptible will get infected. Will get infected. You get that? And I got it. Me. Each susceptible means, say, uh, 100 people per day overall. Of them, C times I over N is the number of people they meet per day who are infected. And each of them gives them a chance beta of getting infected. So this is the overall chance per day they'll get infected. That may be the last time I repeat that because I'm hoping you get six in. Yes, uh, Alex? Mm -hmm. A little confused on the uh, side of your thing. This side? Yeah. So in the lecture that I watched, if you're asking me, it's like SI, or if you got SIR for uh, yeah. successful infectious to the other. Yeah. For each of those. Okay, so if I like, it can be interesting in both of us. S dot. S dot. S dot. The dot. I'm trying to remember who introduced dot. It was, I think it may have been Leibniz. Um, Leibniz. So there is a stupid puzzle between Leibniz and Newton. The English get really uptight about things. And I, I say this with, with most of my ancestry coming from that Emerald Isle. Um, but the English get really, get really stupidly uh, kind of, um, Patriarchal about these these sort of things. That's not quite the right word. They get very uh, ethnocentric about these things sometimes, and they wanted to feel they were at the forefront of mathematics. So Newton basically invented calculus at the same time as Leibniz in Germany, and they, they became this stupid fight between them. Like like I invented it first, and and they competed for notation as well. And Leibniz, I think, used. S dot to indicate like the SDT, whereas Newton preferred the SDT or something like that. There, there were some differences in notation. You see both types um, circulating. Um, the big difference is, I'll be with you just a second, Alex. If you write it um, like DSDT, you could write like DS. I'm not saying you should here, but you know, in general, you could do this as DX. Um, you know, D, D, Y, or whatever. Um, that, but S dot is is the only times I've ever seen it professionally or with respect to time. It's specifically a derivative with respect to time, whereas the DSDT is more general than the. Yeah, Alex, did you hear hand up? Uh, so when would you write? So S is like what is S? Represent? S represents the the count of people who are susceptible right now. Okay. okay. Um. S dot represents how quickly that's changing over time and, and you know, by extension and what, in what um, uh, direction. So S might be a thousand, meaning a thousand people are susceptible right now. DSDT or S dot might be five, meaning each day, five more people are getting susceptible. If S dot were minus five, it would be each day, there's five fewer, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Each day, five fewer people are susceptible, right? Um, uh, and and actually, I, I said it in a way that someone could take issue with it. S dot V5 would be 
each day, the number of people who are susceptible increases by five, right? I, I said five more people are getting susceptible, but you have to be careful with that because that could that could be like that could be interpreted as saying the inflow is 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 the five. No, no, no. S dot is the overall rate of change. It could be zero. If let me ask this. Could could S dot, the rate of change of S be zero and still tons of people are getting infected per day? Yes, how? If yeah, if the number of people recovering is also the same number, S dot could be zero, right? That just, just because S dot is zero, just because the rate of change of the number of susceptibles is zero doesn't mean no one's getting affected. It just means it's imbalanced because the number of new recoveries is equal in this model to the number of new infections, right? Do, do you understand that? Alex, or is, does that cover your question? Okay. Okay, so this is the formula for DSDT. What's the formula for DIDT? By the way, I'll show these all up uh, in a slide form in a moment, but I like to go through it interactively. What's what's the formula for DIDT or I dot? Yeah. Okay, so it's the opposite. That's an important observation. So the inflow is what? C times I over N. Yeah, beta times S. Is it with a plus or a minus? Plus, Y plus. It flows N, right? Minus I over tau. I'm trying to make sure everyone gets this, okay? And I know I'm going a bit slow for some people. I know I'm going super slow for others, but... I just want to be sure this isn't missed because each year when I see the final exam, I wish I got over it more or more slowly. Okay. So here, here we have the two equations, two differential equations. Notice that flows got kind of divided up, right? Like here's one part of one flow, and here's this is kind of the outflow part, this is the inflow part, this is the same flow as that. It, it all gets mapped down and, and the depressed equation to one, one piece. But that's writing down, transcribing the differential equation, transliterating them, just taking what's in this model and writing it down. And in general, you take this for each stock, you consider its rate of change, dsdt, dydt, dxdt, whatever it is. And you write down the sum of the inflows on the right-hand side minus the sum of the outflows. In other words, minus each of the outflows. Does that make sense? Okay. Who is not comfortable with this? Please, please, please. This is your chance to ask questions. Please? Yes, pretty please. Yes, uh, Arlon. I mean, I need two more examples so that I can repeat this more, but when, I mean, now it's more that very easy, but I mean, we need to more practice. Because I still think that I'm struggling translating that part to. Okay, I think um, if I'm not mistaken, in the video, yeah. there's a bunch of examples there. And um, I think I posted those slides. If I didn't, I might try I do, which should provide a bunch of examples. Okay. Um, I, I will also have review sessions for this course before the final way I can go over it. It'll be after the end of the class, yeah. Oh, so It'll be in person. I mean, I, I, I think. I mean, I've normally done them in person. So that'll be my time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this was the first part of the take up exercise. Anyone want to ask questions pretty please? No? Okay. Okay. So um I wrote this down and um I don't know it's why it's called untitled presentation. Um, um it's 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 about this exercise. So here here are these these equations, right? Okay, now for the second component, I ask you, whoa, to solve this. Try to solve it 
for the states of the model for which there will be an equilibrium. That is for the values of the stock S and I, where for which they'll be unchanging. And the values will be given in formulas for S and I. So we'll have a formula for F for, for each equilibrium. We'll have some value for S and some value for I. And uh, those at that point, S equals this, y, uh, I equals that. At that point, the system will be in balance. And there may be more than one. And in general, for an infectious disease model, there will be more than one. So we want to solve this for those. What do we need to do to find the points where the system will be in balance? What are the conditions under which it will be a balance? It will be in balance. Uh, yes, Tony. Okay, the rate of every stop, different than every flow. We might have in equilibrium lots of new infections going on as long as the number of new recoveries is what? Equal to that. So it's not every flow, this is a key point. It's not every flow that's equal to zero, it's every rate of change of every stop. Not, not the stock itself. It's not saying in equilibrium, the number of people are susceptible has to be zero. No, 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 no. Um, it's saying the rate of change of it, how quickly it's going up or down. It's got to not be going up, not be going down. It's got to be staying constant. It's in balance. Does that make sense? It's like your bathtub. When the uh, water's rushing in at the same rate at which it's rushing out. Why don't you think of action time? Uh, so it's uh, so here the the rate of change of s has to be zero and the rate of change of i has to be zero right and if this had more equations associated with, with it the rate of change of each of them has to be zero in equilibrium and we're going to look for the particular values of s and i the particular values for each of these signs for which this is true. Are people okay with that? Okay, there's not a revolt, but neither is the crowd going wild. So, um, so uh, we're gonna find the states of the system, the state of the system of value for F and R, right? That's the state of this system, right? If we have to go to lunch, we're running this model, we have to go to lunch, shut down our computer. We just have to write down two numbers, and that completely summarizes the state for modeling, right? Two numbers for this for this one. For if, if it were in general, you know, a, a model with six stocks, we'd have to write down six numbers, right? Okay. We'll come back to that. This, yeah. Um, anyway, so ladies and gentlemen. We're going to find the state of the system, states of the system for which it will be an equilibrium. Because remember, in a dynamical system, how it changes over the next little bit depends on its state, right? So we're going to find the values of the state for which it doesn't change. Does that make sense? For which it's an equilibrium. Because remember, the stocks drive the flows, right? And we're going to find the values of stocks, if there are any, for which it won't change. Okay? We're going to do this. Okay, so how would you do it? I, of course, have the slides that will walk you through it, but I want to get you think about it. how would you go about finding the values of S and the values of I, pairs of them, S equals this, I equals that. And then that might be one, and then another one would be S equals this, I equals that. Maybe there's two of them. In this case, there are two. How would we, how would we do that? Yes, Tony. Uh, well, I don't know if I can come up Good. And then I do the total 
Okay. Okay, I like I like the way you're thinking. So Cody's very clever. And he notices that the way is a model. We have successfully been practiced, but but you know it's really as long as we know the total population, uh, we can just know the number of successful calculate the number of the factors, right? Because the total population and we call it minus the number of successful. So really to find a system in balance, all we have to do is find the values of S for which will be about because that will give us the values of, of R. Of course, it needs to be imbalanced for both of these equations, but really one number will suffice as long as we know the total possibility. It's just a constant. If it were not a constant, we'd be in. It wouldn't be. But here it is. Okay, so what Tony's saying is for simple algebra, solve this for us, but solve it in terms of what? Like we could, through algebra, we could go and 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 do a solution for it. But what needs to be on the right hand side? Not anything. And that the right hand side needs to consist only of, and students miss this quite often. The right hand side needs to consist only of. I, I said it in the in the assignment. The, the the formula, each such formula will in general involve what? The, the parameters, yeah, good. The parameters and, and constants like one, and that's fine. And and n is a constant here, the total population. What it should not have on the right hand side, you solve for s, what should not be on the right hand side? Well, s should not be because you have to solve for s, though, right? But what else shouldn't be on the right hand side? I should not be on the right hand side. I should not be on the right hand side. You're solving. For S, you're solving for a particular value of S. If I is on the right hand side, you're not solving for a value. It's got a variable in there. I want to solve for a value of I for which this will be an, an, an equilibrium, or a value of S for which it, it will be an equilibrium. Yes. I think I said there are two things. Okay. Good. Good. Doesn't that actually change the way that's going to be the I mean, I think most of the things will be. Remain the same as the fact that well, now the S will be the I mean, it, there are going to be very different states represented, but yes, there will be two. And you're absolutely correct that there are cases where I is zero or not zero. So, so let's go through this, ladies and gentlemen. We want to solve this. We want to solve it. And one thing you could note from this is if, if you want to solve this, you've got this. You've got this equation here equals zero, right? Um, over over here, I'm, I'm trying to make sure it shows up. Okay. Um, and I'll 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 go. I'll, I think I'll show you the the slide because it just people online particularly will be able to see it. Um, if if you have this, do you notice something? If if you want this thing to equal zero, do you notice something about this? There's something in there that is common to all terms that if it's equal to zero you, you have to, to be able to get rid of it what is it like i the eyes have it it didn't go wild about that either i don't, I don't understand okay the eyes have it yes if we want to solve for this equal to zero um we could divide through it but i like tony's suggestion what tony had commented as well Tony is very clever. He said, look, the total population is this. So here, look, uh, S plus I equals S. And, and it follows that you take the derivative of both sides. Fine. S dot plus I dot plus N dot. And what is N dot? What is it? Zero. The rate of change for the total population is zero. So that implies. S dot equals minus I dot. And when, which makes sense, right? Because like S dot is minus I dot. You can just see it, right? You can, I mean, you can read it off as well, right? Like this is the minus of that, right? All you do is 
everything has a plus here and put a minus and run many every minus you put a plus does that make sense okay so so given this all we really have to do is solve one one thing one thing you know solve say for i uh for i as god we can calculate from i don't need to do the first place either way okay but suppose we want to solve for this i dot equals zero, what can we do? We can, as as Ardalan said, we can divide by zero. Or we can divide by i. But if we're going to divide by i, we have to be careful. Why? What could go wrong? What could go wrong if we divide by i? Does that mean you're zero? Yes, if i is zero, that would be bad. Like, don't do that, right? I could joke that's why the Roman Empire fell. They divided by zero, but actually, I heard it was it was actually a dull point for a second. Sorry, don't 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 we have to be careful. We can't just divide blindly by zero. Um, bad things will be happening. We get zero by zero on the right hand side. It will be still defined. The, 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 the left side, um, it, it, would, it, would, it would not be uh, um, uh, acceptable to do. So uh, if I were zero, we're going to have to handle that case. The other case is I is not equal to zero. If I is not equal to zero, what can we do? We can divide by, it, and then we'll get a simplified situation. It'll be a thing of delight, will it not? Okay, maybe for me, maybe not for you, but just for me. Um, okay, so let's deal with the i equals zero case. So, so you tell me if i equals zero, we're halfway done. We know we'll value i. So what is n? Yeah, that's equals that. It, 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 yeah, that's equals that. Right? What is what does that say in intuitive terms? Everyone is susceptible. And how many are infected? Zero. Nobody's infected. It's called a disease-free equilibrium. Everyone is susceptible. Nobody's protected. Is it imbalanced there? Why is it imbalanced? No one will get infected, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody will get infected, right? Okay. The force of infection will be what? Well, the fractional prevalence will be what? Fractional prevalence will be one. It'll be zero. So the force of infection be zero. If I'm a susceptible, how much do I have to worry about getting infected? No. I equals zero. Zero. I don't have to worry at all. I can take off this mask. Right? Um, yes, or what? Um, I think it's logic doesn't make sense. So how do you how are you that? I mean I'm trying to every time I start to make a sound like that. You cannot be susceptible and don't give me the susceptible smallpox. Right? I, I'm terribly successful with smallpox. If, small if someone with smallpox were to come into the room, it would probably kill us. I've never been vaccinated on smallpox. Smallpox is terribly lethal. And if I were to go touch the bodily fluids of someone with Ebola, I would use them. Uh, uh, Okay, yeah. So, so I, I mean, I'm susceptible to smallpox, even though it's eradicated. Um, I'm, I'm susceptible to the future variants of, of, of COVID, SARS CoV 2, which are not yet here. So, I mean, susceptibility is a biological map and I'm susceptible to them. So, now, everyone can be successful. Nobody has to be affected. Um, 
I think there's a good chance for it now. Nobody in Saskatoon is affected by Ebola. Everyone is susceptible to it. Um, uh, so there's nothing, you know, it, contradictory about a situation where everyone is susceptible, no one's affected. Is the question I had is, is this imbalance? Yeah. Because pressure prevalence is what? Zero. Force infection is what? The number of new infections per day is what? Zero because you take two to tango. No successful to get infected, right? And the number of new recoveries is what? Zero. So both these flows are zero. Everyone is susceptible, no one's infected. That's one equilibrium. It's kind of a trivial equilibrium. And one of the things that concerns us, and we don't have time to go into it this year in class, is um, this is probably an unstable equilibrium in many cases, meaning if the infection were to come into the room, if smallpox were to come in to the room, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, the proverbial sigh and, and uh, dark cloak, um, you know, it, it would be disastrous. It would be an outbreak. And one of the things we worry about is whether the disease free delivery is stable or unstable. And stable means, you know, someone could come in, pick a box into this room, and a few people get infected, will probably die out because most of us have protection. Someone could come in. Well, okay, I'm going on. Um, but uh, but uh, there are the concerns if, if the situation is such that it's not stable, like if the, the levels of protection against pertussis are so low in some communities that if someone flew in from Netherlands who've been exposed to pertussis, um, that they could cause a little effort. So disease-free equilibrium is a real equilibrium. And it's the equilibrium of great interest and great concern about whether it's stable or not. We don't have time to go into this here. But the other case is the endemic equilibrium. So for the endemic equilibrium, what can we do? Well, we had this formula here, right? And what can we do? If we know I equals zero, not equal to zero, what can we do here? Ardalan said it earlier. We do what? Divide by I. Dividing both sides by I, we get this. Now that's a freebie. That, I mean, you look at that. I mean, that this is a thing. Okay, so what is... I said this was a thing of life. So what do we want to do? We want to solve for what? For want to solve for x. We already know um, that i is not zero, but we don't know its value yet. But we at least want to solve for f, and then we can get r, right? So, so can we solve this for f? We can. There's nothing else here. There's only one f, and everything else is a constant here, right? It's either a parameter or are constant like what a literal time. So we can just rearrange this and solve for s. Can we not? Yes. Yeah. Can we solve this in a key way like c one? Yeah. Yeah. Um so here we go. So we can just rearrange, right? We put this thing over on the right. I mean um solve for it that way. And then Given that we solve for S, what do we have to get? Remember, for each equilibrium, we have to get a value of S and value of Y for that equilibrium, a complete state of the model in which it's in balance. So we have S, what do we still have to get? I. So how are we going to get I? We have S, how are we going to get I? Yeah, yeah, we know S plus I equals N. So we will go and say I equals N minus S. We have S, you can subtract it from N and get I. And so they, we get I equals to this value here, N times one over, one minus one over C beta tau. So we have solved for now the disease free equilibrium. In other words, sorry, for the, the end of equilibrium, the situation where 
the infection is is in equilibrium, but there is infection in the population. Is everyone here susceptible? No. What fraction of the population is susceptible? Yeah, yeah, one. So the fraction of N that is susceptible is one over C beta tau, right? Right? But C beta tau would count. This would be saying one tenth of the population. So that, you got that? The C beta tau were 20. This would be 5% of population. So if C beta tau were 2, how much of the population would be susceptible? Yeah, this is the And I is the rest of the population, right? You got that? Or, or, okay. So this is an equilibrium. There's people who are effective and there's people who are susceptible. Now, do you recognize something here? Kitchen time. It's not like the first person to die. Yes, it is. Yes, it is the basic reproductive number. C beta tau is the number of people that we infected by. One infective in an otherwise susceptible population before they recover. Hmm? Why is that? Why is that? Let's let's go back and look at our model here. So remember, C beta tau is just contacts per day times probability per discordant contact times mean time infective. So why do I say that that product will be the number of people that that initial infected will infect before they recover. So how many, so suppose I'm a, the first infected, I'm the first infected, how many people do I meet per day in the population overall? Oh, how many overall do I meet per day? C, C, okay, per day, per day. So maybe I'm an infective and I meet 100 people per day total. Of them, how many are susceptible? How many of them are, by, by what we're thinking about, for the basic reproductive number, how many of the people around that first infected are susceptible? Everyone. Everyone. Remember, basic reproductive number is defined as the number of people that the first infected will infect in an otherwise uninfected population, right? Otherwise, and, and here we'll, we're not going to deal with vaccination, so we'll say otherwise fully successful population. So all of them will be with, with successful population. All C people per day will be with successful, right? Each of them all over probability of what is infected? Beta probability. So how many people will I infect? Well, I actually infect. So I'm an infected, but I'm circulating in this C, this veritable C of susceptible. How many people will I infect per day? Beta times C, C times beta. I've got an extra okay. All of them are susceptible, and each of them maybe I have a five percent chance of infecting, right? Right? If, if, if that's the case, I affect 100 times 0.05 or five people per day, right? Per day. And then if I want to consider, as the basic reproductive number says, how many people I infect before I recover, ladies and gentlemen, what do I have to multiply by? If I want to consider, so that's per day, C beta. And then I have to consider over all the days of my illness, how many will I infect? C times beta times tau. Do we see C times beta times tau somewhere? Yes. Where do we see it? Right there. Right there. C beta tau. Right there. C beta tau. That is the basic 
reproductive number, ladies and gentlemen. So, so in endemic equilibrium, in a situation where the section stays in the population, the fraction that remains is susceptible. If the reciprocal of the number of people in the population is divided by basic reproduction, how does the fraction that stays susceptible? Fraction for this model that are, let's say, infected with the rest of the population. Right? Does that make sense? Now, this should jive. This should jive with what I was saying the other day. Because in an equilibrium state, where infection is circulating, how many people will an infected infect before they recover? If it's in equilibrium, how many people will they infect before they recover? Uh -huh. One, one, and that infective in a purely susceptible population would have infected basic reproductive number of people before they recovered. But if the people around them are heavily not susceptible, it's only one over are not people around them are susceptible. If only one over are not of the population is susceptible, which is what's shown here, right? Um, then how many people will they recover? How many, sorry, how many people would they affect? So, so they, if they were surrounded by susceptible state effect or not, but they're surrounded instead by only, only one over or not if the people around them are susceptible. Guess how many people they'll infect before they recover? One. You see that? It's the reproductive number times one over it. In general, if you have a fraction of the people around you that are susceptible, you will in fact F times R not people before you recover. And that is called the what? The effective reproductive number, R star, or RT, or RE. It goes by different names. This is a daily thing to talk about. It was something we estimated daily for all provinces. The birth nation for verbs in six provinces for this city, etc. There it is. There it is. This is the effective reproductive. What is what is F here? What did I say it was? What did I say it was? Speak on vigorous youths. So so F is the fraction that are susceptible, not infected. The fraction susceptible. Wait, this might be another good thing to get for the online folks. What do you think? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So so it should all make sense that if they're surrounded by purely by susceptibles, they'll affect our not people. If they're sur surrounded by in a situation where only one of our not of the people around them are susceptible, then they're going to affect one person before they recover. And that's exactly what they true is for. You see that? And in general, this, this is for this particular model. But in general, for an infectious disease model where you have infection staying present in endemic equilibrium, at equilibrium, the effective reproductive number will equal one. Okay. And so at equilibrium, at endemic equilibrium, 
equilibrium be r star equals one. And that will mean the number, the fraction of the population that is susceptible is one over if the fraction that is susceptible is one over the basic reproductive number. So if we have a basic reproductive number of 10, what fraction of the population will remain susceptible in endemic equilibrium? If R naught is 10, what fraction of the population will remain susceptible? One. Yeah, one over 10. One tenth, right? If we're in a situation where XBB 1.5 or XBB 1.6 is around 17, what fraction of the population will remain susceptible? Now, in this case, we also have that many. Yeah. But that would be a good one for a study. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, the folks that are not susceptible either have to be vaccinated or they need to be. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, no, I mean, uh, not in the not in the sense that they'd be represented as that. They'd be represented as having uh, limited susceptibility, but they wouldn't be grouped into the F compartment. They'd be in a separate compartment, and they'd have a much lower chance, typically, of getting a good vaccine. Wouldn't this change the Oh, absolutely. This is very specifically for this model. Oh. Yeah. I mean, this that is not a general formula. Uh, I mean, this, this, I uh, equal to what is the case is if you have an endemic infection. has to be such that the effective reproductive number is one. And that will mm -hmm. typically mean a fraction of the population that is susceptible is one over the basic okay. um, uh, uh, So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so we have two, two equilibria. We could draw them on a board here if we drew susceptible from this axis or S, and we drew infectives so on this axis or I. I called this sort of plot a certain name. Does anyone remember it? That began with S. It's called a state space plot. Okay. Um, state space plot. So we have one equilibrium that disease free. Where is that located? Where is the disease free equilibrium located? Zero infective skin, how many susceptible? Everyone. So I'll, I'll put it up out here. And zero infective. And then we have another equilibrium that's located here, where we have S smaller than S might be basic reproductive number is greater than one, and some number of, of infected, right? Um, and these were on the same scale. You know, we could sort of draw 45 degree line here where, you know, they always come up to, to end. 
and it's going to be somewhere along you know, this the two episodes kind of but maybe a maybe a scene right um so and so this is going to be in terms of its location the number of contestables will be n over the basic reproductive number and the number of perspectives will be n times one over one minus the basic reproductive in other words, it's everyone else, right? Hmm? And part of the fear is that if an outbreak occurred in this state, if, if it's an unstable disease free equilibrium, what's going to happen as the outbreak occurs? What's going to happen? We imagine it's starting here with a little marble and it starts over here. Starts it starts over here. What's going to happen? Okay, well, can in fact, and what will happen? Well, okay, so let's suppose this is suppose the basic reproductive number is 10. What, what's going to happen? Okay, it will rise. And as it rises, where will it rise? Well, susceptible will decrease, and effective will what? Increase. Um, could susceptible decrease by 10 and effective increase by 5? Or no, they have to susceptible increases, susceptible decreases by the what? The same amount that effective increase. So it's along the 45 degree line. Let's we'll proceed along here. Do you see that? As susceptible decrease, effective increase by the same amount, right? Proceed along here. And maybe it will bounce back a little bit, but it will, or it'll maybe it'll go directly to here, depending on the system. I guess for this one, it'll go directly to here. It will remain, right? Um, Why would it bounce back? And and another system with three stocks, it would, it would certainly bounce. Yeah, yeah, uh, most certainly. Uh, if you have exposed that, for um, it it uh it might overshoot and then come back. Yeah. Kind of, you can have that in a very common and endemic delivery of the cycle throughout. Probably shown in a moment ago. But um, here it could go to delivery. So this is movement in state space, right? This is what's called the state space plot. And notice that this captures in a single diagram change in the speaker. Probably. When we create plots, you know, most of the plots we've looked at this semester of behavior of models have had what on the x axis? Plot. And, you know, we might plot out the number of susceptibles here, right? Um, and we might plot out something like this. Uh, it comes down quickly and then maybe. And he goes like that, and then the number of perspectives, maybe I'll do it in a different color. Um, God, I saw. Ooh, ooh, look at this. Looky that. Okay. Um, ooh, look at that. I got purple, I got red. Okay, I've got all the colors of the rainbow. This is, this is a, Talk about a thing of delight. Okay, um, somehow I can't reach the red, so I think I'll have to deal with 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 purple. If that's okay. Um, it's not quite as big a contrast as I like, but here we go. Um, maybe we have something like that for attractive. In short, we have different curves. This this is a map. This state space map is a map of behavior of of a system. You can imagine a, a ball rolling down, a little marble rolling down and following these trajectories. Mm -hmm. Yes, period. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good question. So why is it not in equilibrium 
when the susceptibles equal to the effectives. Um, okay, so let's, let's give that some thought. Um, we can, in fact, plug it in to our equations here, right? Um, so so we, we have equations here. So if we had susceptibles equals infectives, that would, and, and given that we have S plus I equals N, given that they collectively make up the whole population, each of these would have to be equal to N over two, right? Like it'd be half the population, right? So, so let's think about what that would yield. Um, uh, could it be an equilibrium? Well, if by chance it was this, but it depends on what what uh, the basic reproductive number is, actually. Um, so here I would be. So you know we could write this down. I think I'll. I'll just change this in place if that's okay. Um, I would be n over two now, right? Um, and uh, this would be n over two here. And this would be n over two. And so I'm replacing each f and each i with n over two. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I can do the same thing down here, but it's just the flip side of it. So let's see what that would yield. If we simplify it a bit, this would be n over two tau, right? And this n and this n would cancel. And so this would be one half here. Um, and we're gonna see if this is in equilibrium. So this would be one half and this would be n over two, okay? Um, and, and so then the question is, you know, is, so this is going to be n. So dsdt be equal to n over two tau minus. So that's some number, right? N over two tau minus c times one half times beta times n over two. And I'm going to simplify this because this is just one half. So I'm going to make it c beta times n over. I just combine these two and, and the two in the head. So the real question is, is, is this thing equal to zero? That's the question. And I see we have N here in both these terms, so I can get rid of that. So it's one over, and, and so this is C beta over four. So the question is, like this would be an equilibrium under very special conditions if, C beta divided by four is equal to one over two tau. If that's not the case, then like if C beta divided by four is greater than one over two tau, this DSDT will be going down. It, so in, in short, um, generally speaking, if R zero is a big number, the number of susceptibles has to be a very small fraction of population. Because, because if there were many susceptibles around, what would happen? Anyone? If, 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 if R0 is really high, it's like it's a really, for example, really highly contagious disease. If we have many susceptibles around, what's going to happen? Many people get infected, and an infected will infect more than one people before they recover. More, well, they'll affect more than one person. Remember, in equilibrium, you can only infect one person before they recover, right? Um, so in in general, we're gonna need to have susceptibles be only a small fraction of the population for very big reproductive numbers. Um, like for measles, where it's it's around um, what it is for Omicron, 17, 18, on uh, some societies, possibly as high as 20. 20 would imply only 5% of the population to be susceptible and have measles be in equilibrium. Because if there's more people, it's so transmissible that all it takes is 10% of people around infected to be susceptible. And they'll infect more than one person before they recover. And that will allow it to spread, right? If, if an infected infects more than one person on the time they recover, 
then each of those people may infect more than one person before they recover and can spread it, double, it, double, it, double, it, which would be the beginning of the So, bringing it to equilibrium, we really needed to have a number of susceptible to one over the base increase productive number. And unless the base reproductive number is two, the basic reproductive number were two, you would get this situation exactly. Um, and you know, I could I could actually solve uh, for that uh, here. So indeed, um, so I can multiply both sides by tau. Um, tau times zero is that, and I have C beta tau here. Multiply both sides by two, so I'd have one minus C beta tau over two uh, equals zero and and if I then right uh, took this on that side and multiplied this, I'd have, yeah. so if I put this over there, it'll be C beta tau times two on the right hand side and one on the left hand side, multiplied by two on both sides, and I'd have C beta, this would be true, true if, so in other words, um, F, uh, equals I over equals N over two is equilibrium. Equilibrium if, if and only if R naught or C beta tau equals R naught, C beta tau equals R naught equals two. It's under that case, it will be an imbalance. Generally, half of people be successful is too many to allow it to spread. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, other questions? So these are great questions. Okay. This is a state space plot. And in general, ladies and gentlemen, when we're getting to um when when we're 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 going and we're having state space uh we're we're having nonlinear systems. We're going to have state space plots that can be uh, have multiple what are called basins of attraction, and I'm going to show that here. Um, I'll just give you a, a, a brief glimpse because we're almost out of time. Um, so one of the many consequences of of uh, nonlinear systems is we have state spaces that can have multiple basins of attraction, okay? Um, and in general, a state space plot will look something like this. I, I spoke about how, how you could think of having a marble that starts in a situation, say, with the D3 equilibrium, and it rolls that marble, and this whole space is what's called a vector. Meaning at any one point, the derivative points in a certain direction. If you're at this state space, point space, you're going to move this way. You know, it's susceptible from the x axis, it's actually from the right axis. And what tells us what direction this is pointing is what the x is, the ds is, the dy is. So, so we put a marble down at a certain point, it will follow these. Flow line dictated by the SDT and the IDT, it'll follow it and it may loop around, for example, here and settle down and an equilibrium here. And in general, we're going to have multiple equilibrium, we could have multiple basins of attraction. Okay, um, we might have certain areas of the state space. Where it's going in one direction, other areas of the state space where it's going in another. And once you're in that basin, it's like a catchment area for water, right? Um, uh, the water in this zone maybe goes to the Arctic Ocean. The water in this zone maybe goes to the Gulf of Mexico. The water in another zone close to the Pacific. And you have these different basins of attraction. Where the state is going to equilibrium in that area. Uh, so here I'm showing 
two equilibrium, one stable, one unstable. But often we can get in a situation where we're going to have in the state space context multiple basins of attraction. So you might have a, a basin of attraction up here or things here go to this equilibrium. Things in, in this region go to this equilibrium and things in, re, in this region go to this one. These are what are called basins of attraction. Uh, and they can represent a certain lock-in effect often where where you, when you move in this space, you go into a certain area and you get you can get stuck there, or you can get stuck in this area or, or that area. I mean, we have a lot of systems in the real world which are like this, where, you know, uh, societally, or in terms of physical systems, or or socioeconomically, the system can get in these different states, and in any one area. It goes to a certain equilibrium or circles around an equilibrium. This is called the limit cycle, where it will circle around an equilibrium, um, but never quite get there. And we see those in natural systems. For example, where we see um, uh, lynxes and hare populations oscillating on a year-by-year -year basis, they never stay totally, totally uh, constant but rather they circle around a certain equilibrium. Ecological systems are like that. Natural systems, human systems are often like this. And one of the challenges with these systems are once you're in one of these basins, it's often, it's a lot harder to get out once you're in than it is to avoid getting at it in the first place. So you might think about this associated with certain adverse situations. Maybe in a software company, just being in a constant firefighting mode, having low code base quality, lots and lots of bugs, lots of issues with poor morale, losing people all the time, high turnover of staff, high documentation needs, which makes the job less, less exciting. Um, inability to keep people and therefore inability to invest in technologies. Or maybe this could be cycles associated with addiction and, and people getting caught up in adverse uh, circumstance with respect to, to uh, their socioeconomic and their health, as well as their social supports. Maybe it's issues having to do with the relationships and, and interpersonal violence and, and personal relationships. But systems can be in different states. And it can take an awful lot of work to shift the system from one state to the other. And so I would say, ladies and gentlemen, with respect to COVID, we are in one of these states right now. And it's not necessarily the best state that we're in, um, but it's in one state. And if we wanted to shift it to another basin with you know lower levels of, of infection, et cetera, it would take a lot of work to get it out of that state and shift it into these other basins. But within a given basin, it will stay within that basin. And shifting between basins often takes a lot of ad additional energy or effort or, or initiatives to shift it. So these sort of these sort of state space plots, uh, which I don't have time to go into in detail, um, can be mapped out very easily for these sort of differential equations. Really, all we're doing is we're plotting out how the system changes, what directions the uh, DFCC, the YDC go in, and so on over time. And we plot out its trajectory. So, given run of the ball, it's like a, a rolling of a marble along with these blue conductors. Okay, that's all we have time to talk about today. I'm going to be assigning another video for next time. And we're going to be quickly looking at an additional form of modeling. So we're going to be looking at discrete event simulation for a single lecture, but it'll be a significant lecture, and I'd like you to take a look at it, okay? And we'll talk about it next time and do some in-class work with discrete events. Okay, um, great. Good luck with the assignment, and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Yeah, thanks.